Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Michael Grouske, and I'm one of this year's Ath Fellows. Occasionally, Chef Dave will make his dinner menu selections based on the subject of the talk. Uh, however, tonight, to the best of my knowledge, that hasn't been done. Um, insects, insects play a unique role in culinary history. In the West, they don't usually factor into our cuisine, but an estimated two billion people around the world rely on bugs as a food source, and some even consider them to be a delicacy. In 2013, the UN released a report which recommended consumption of insects as a healthier and more sustainable alternative to other sources of food. As food sustainability becomes increasingly important, it will be necessary for us to rethink some of our preconceived notions about eating bugs. Tonight's speaker, Pat Crowley, is on the leading edge of a culinary revolution. He is the founder of Chopwool, the first company to mass produce insect protein products in the United States. Beginning with handmade cricket flour energy bars, Mr. Crowley has grown Chopwool through crowdfunding, eventually taking the company on the hit TV show Shark Tank, winning a major investment from Mark Cuban. Mr. Crowley graduated from CMC in 2002 with a degree in Spanish and psychology, and in 2007, he received a master's degree in watershed management from the University of Arizona. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording is prohibited. Please welcome Pat Crowley to the Athenaeum. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me if I'm out here, or should you want me behind the mic here? Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Very excited to be here. I've been doing a lot of talks recently, but I think this is by far what I've been most excited about, uh, being an alum, having literally sat in those chairs and watched some, some brilliant talks that really shaped my worldview and, and kind of who I am today. So it's, it's an honor to be here. And I don't know who dropped the ball and let me up here, but uh, <laughs> thank you for being here. Budget cuts affect us all, I guess. <clears throat> Uh, often when I tell people what I'm doing, uh, the usual question is, you know, why, of course, why insects? And I, I quickly analyze how much time do I have to, to give this answer because there's quite a bit of backstory, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to tell the majority of that backstory here today. So kind of start with when I was sitting in these chairs at, at CMC. Um, I, I started getting kind of a worldview, I think, when I, I studied abroad in Spain and really became fascinated with anthropology and you know, reading Jared Diamond about you know, the future of our species and, and kind of where we came from and, and our, our interaction with our natural resources and, and kind of what, what that looks like from a global perspective. And uh, it's, it can, it's, it's not hard to have a, a pessimistic outlook when you look at kind of our overconsumption. And, and I, I really struggled with that I'm a very optimistic person and kind of where I fit in the mix. And, uh, after CMC, I had a couple jobs, wasn't really into that, wasn't really passionate about you know, having a, a global impact. And so uh, I think a couple years after I graduated, put my degree to good use and quit our jobs and packed our backpacks and went on a hitchhiking trip through Central America. And, uh, ended up down in Panama, worked at a surf camp down in Panama for about a year. And along the route and, and kind of in that time there is where I really formulated um, the, the idea that, that water is, is one of the biggest issues the globe faces, access to fresh water. And uh, I, I saw kind of intimately the communities that were affected um, by that lack of access on a daily basis. So I, that's why I returned home to uh, pursue a, a master's degree in, in water policy, essentially. And I, I was actually, when I was at the surf camp, I would have to take a boat to a bus and go three hours to the closest internet, and like apply to grad school online, and take a bus back and a boat back and work for a week at the camp. And so it was, a, it was a long endeavor. And then I, I got into graduate school and the summer before I thought, you know, why the best way to kind of prep for studying hydrology is to go live on a river. So I became a whitewater rafting guide the summer for graduate school. And that I would say just as much impacted my kind of view on, on Western water resources, um, just as much as, as my education. So I kind of had every intent of returning back to 
kind of developing countries in, in pursuing you know, water, water projects, but through my education is where I really saw just how unsustainable our water use is here, especially in the west, uh, western half of the United States. So I decided to dive in, and my first job was with the Arizona Department of Water Resources, and I was thrilled to work for an organization that had that kind of longer term view on, on you know, our, our, our communities and being able to plan further out than what I thought in the private sector had you know, much more short term goals. And so it was, it was with great honor that I was working for you know, an agency that had that, that view of what I thought you know, the, the seventh generation, the, the generations that will never know um, and looking out for their, their betterment. So what I learned at the Arizona Department of Water Resources was a basic economic curve here. Graph. This is all you have to know is that the red line is our demand and the blue line is the supply and this happens to be the Colorado River. Obviously there's a point of conflict when our demand meets our supply and adding the units you can see that that line, those lines crossed over a, about a decade ago, over a decade ago. So this is playing out and many resources around the world, but you know, here it's, it's evident that this is no longer something that we can put off. Our overconsumption of water resources, you know, land resources, the uh, availability of, of um, our climate to withstand uh, carbon emissions. Th th this isn't something that's going to happen in the future. We are in the 11th hour, and this is a graph that shows very evidently that we are literally drinking the water of our children right now eating the, the food of our children. So I, I dove in to, to try and stop some of this and, and essentially balance our supply and demand curves. And <clears throat> I remember it was a few weeks into to working and we had a, a, another graph. We were showing future projections of, of the state, you know, where the demand was coming from and then the, the supply underneath that. And there was this, there was the, you know, the Colorado River and there was groundwater resources and then there was this future supply. <laughs> I remember looking around me like, what's, what's the future supply? No one had an idea. I was like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> We're the ones responsible for planning this, the future of our civilization here, and we don't know where our future supply is coming from? I was like, what the? <laughs> like, everyone stop. Everyone put your phones out right now. Like, we got to figure this out. Like, there's nothing more important than our water, maybe our, and our food, maybe oxygen and making sure you're not currently bleeding to death. But other than that, like, <laughs> there's nothing more important. We should stop everything we're doing until we figure this out. So here, so if we, if looking at that supply and demand, uh, it, it, it was preposterous to propose a, a, a decline in, or I, I got frustrated with you know, the, the theory that we'll just come up with future resources. So I decided to really focus on our demand of water resources. In the West, this is our demand. California specifically, 90% of our water goes to agriculture. This is the Colorado River, and it's showing most of what we grow is, is alfalfa in the, in the middle of the desert here. So very, at this stage, we know it's an extremely gross misuse of water. Um, very water intensive crop, and it's used to feed cattle that are very inefficient at, at getting us protein. Um, and we were doing very little with kind of conservation at this level. Everything that we did to, to try and incentivize conservation was just uh, outweighed completely by, by market forces. And that was really a frustrating point for me working at that planning level. And everything that we did do for conservation that we communicated with, with our constituents and our, our, our consumer base was focused around you know, what they use at home, a, a tiny sliver of the pie. But we, thought, we just thought that the consumer, everyday person, couldn't make those multiple connections between you know, the water that they use, but also what they put on their plate and the water that's consumed there. So we, we didn't have that conversation when it came to conservation because the farmers are gonna grow what they sell, what sells is what we eat. And so it was very evident that that's where the true decisions are made, is at the consumer level, every day, what we decide to eat, that's what we're gonna water. And so uh, I became really excited when I, I learned about the concept of, of eating insects. And, um, well, I have this 
photo up there specifically I, to give you an analogy. So um, we often talk about kind of turning the tap off when you brush your teeth as a big conservation message. I, I looked recently at the California Department of Water Resources site and uh, I didn't see anything on their water conservation section about diet. But so we also often talk about kind of, you know, using, turning off the tap when you brush your teeth, low flow toilets, et cetera. But the equivalent of one hamburger to a tap when you're brushing your teeth is, is basically like turning the tap on, brush your teeth, keep it on, keep it running, put your toothbrush down, go to work, go to school for the day, come back at lunchtime, make sure it's still full blast, then nobody's turning it off, go back to work or school, come back for dinner, and then turn it off. So all day long, that's one hamburger wa worth of water. Yet often what we talked about was you know, turning it off for those microseconds. And that, that's really where the, the conflict I saw was. So when, when insects came along, I thought, wow, here's a great opportunity to, to potentially communicate with the, the consumer about uh, an incredibly efficient form of food. For example, uh, what we're mostly growing here is that alfalfa. So the feed to biomass ratio, this was, this was the, the stat that really drove it home for me. I listened to a TED talk one day, kind of looking through this lens of, of water conservation. And if you take 10 pounds of feed and you give it to a cow, it grows about one pound. Of that, about 40% of it is actually edible. But if you give it to locusts, they grow about eight pounds. And, and the majority of that is actually edible. And, and that, that isn't is just excess fiber. So incredibly more efficient from the starting gate. When you look at a water perspective, insects are over 10 times more efficient than cattle at, at converting water into grams of protein, and even more efficient than, than substitutes like soy and corn. Uh, we're working on a project right now in, uh, in Southeast Asia where we're feeding our insects uh, organic banana plantation waste, so the palm fronds, et cetera, from banana trees as well as, as, palm, as, well as palm fronds go into the insect farm, and, and that's entirely what they eat. And so it's kind of agricultural byproduct, and that's where really the savings begin is where we take production out of our current system and essentially just plug a hole in our, our inefficiency of our food system. So these, these will become kind of even greater as we continually develop the, the agricultural part of this. And then they happen to be extremely nutritious as well. So uh, twice the, pro the, the flour that we make is twice the protein of beef, uh, high in other micronutrients, and it's really kind of a standalone value proposition in and of itself. Um, here we have a photo of a Thai market, and there's some like 1,600 varieties of insects eaten around the world. And in Thailand, there's hundreds and hundreds of them if you go down a market and, and see something like this. So that's one of the parts that I really get excited about is that there's the potential of insects to really increase the diversity of our food supply as well. We've been on the, a pretty dangerous trend of, of a lack of diversity in our food supply, really monoculture style of agriculture. And, and that's one of the biggest issues I have with you know potential GMOs is that it's really decreasing the diversity of our food supply, and that's, uh, it's a very poor risk management strategy. My, I'm only here today because my ancestors, 150, 200 years ago, were a part of the potato famine. <laughs> so if you want to talk about food diversity and what it can do to, to a civilization, it's a great example. Uh, it, it also is, is very robust at um, adapting to a cha changing climate. So insects are, can grow in a really wide range of climates. We're, we're leaning heavily. We, we know that animal proteins are, are pretty inefficient, so we're looking pretty heavily at plant protein, but oftentimes they have a really fragile climate window that they grow in, especially some of the leading plant proteins that we're looking at, like lentils, for example. Very fragile climate window, so a, a sudden or, or a large shift in our climate, and it could be devastating to a, a food, global food supply that relies strictly on, on plant proteins. So super efficient, super healthy, increase the diversity, uh, very robust to a changing climate. <laughs> why aren't we eating these things? Here's why. 
That's the one reason that we don't eat them, is this face right here. It's purely cultural. I was not the first one to come up with this idea, but decade after decade, academics have been saying, makes sense for all these reasons, but people won't accept it. But our culture isn't ready for it. So in 2012, we decided to question that, that assumption and, and challenge that assumption, essentially, and see if people were ready for it and, and challenge that cultural component of it. Luckily for us, there's plenty of other examples of, of uh, remarketing, essentially, of, of cultural biases around food products. And this is an example of lobster. They were considered this complete junk fish or junk food. Uh, they would just wash up in, on the eastern seaboard in, in mass and just kind of rot on the, on the beaches. And in, in fact, in, in the 1930s, New York State Penitentiary made it illegal to feed inmates lobster more than three days a week because it was considered inhumane treatment of the inmates. And now it went through a very concerted rebranding effort. Now it's one of the highest protein, highest price proteins on the market. Another example is, is sushi, more recent example. So the early 60s, the sushi industry struggled. Sushi industry, I always slip that one. That's a hard one to say. Struggled to, to get a foothold here in the United States. And then a very strategic man by the name of Chiro Mishida here in Los Angeles, actually, um, came up with this, which is the California roll. And it was very craftily developed to be a very gentle introduction for Americans. And what he did was, that was brilliant was he put the rice on the outside of the nori. So this foreign looking seaweed, it removed that visual component. And then he put avocado in and kind of eased us into this foreign texture of raw fish where previously it was repulsive to think of eating raw fish. And lo and behold, that was just the gentle introduction that we needed for a multi-billion dollar industry here in the US in kind of the late 60s, early 70s. So that's what we knew we had to do. So 2012-ish, uh, my, my CMC roommate was on a cross-country trip and he stopped to my house and I, I fried up some crickets and I was like, Dan, we have to come up with the California roll of insects. <laughs> Launch this into US market and, and he was into it and, and so we, we created a business plan and we, we created a Kickstarter campaign and, and launched it. And, and lo and behold, that was kind of the beginning of, of the, our journey. And, it, and it's much more than just a simple kind of cultural introduction. It, it's really, you know, in the beginning, I had that title of reverse engineering a, a supply chain. And, and there's plenty of other examples of how cultural perception really does engineer a, a supply chain. And, and a really classic example is this fish, does anyone know what species of fish this is? <laughs> That's right, we talked about it at our table. Sea bass, good, good analysis there. Uh, yeah, this is a sea bass. So sea bass are viewed as, as a really high-end fish and they were, at, at the consumer level, viewed as this high-end fish and so people paid a lot of money for them, especially in, in the Mediterranean. I think traditionally people went on vacation and in Spain and the south of France, so maybe when they brought it home, it was kind of a taste of vacation or something. I don't know where it origina originated from because study after study shows that consumers cannot tell the difference in taste between sea bass and m most other white fish when prepared similarly. There's no higher quality protein. It's, there's nothing really of higher quality other than this kind of perception. Yet, because that was in place, there was really high margins and that funded the farming of sea bass. Sea bass are one of the worst fish to farm. They, they do not tolerate dense populations very well. They need a lot of room, and they're, they're blind when they're at the juvenile stage, so you have to feed them live feed, which we just you know, ravish our oceans to get this krill to give them live feed. And that ratio, a biomass ratio, is something like 17 pounds go in for every one pound out. But because we just paid a lot of money for it at the consumer level, it funded this industry of, of farming sea bass. And so that's what we're trying to do with insects is over here we know it's efficient, and we know it's a sustainable commodity, and so let's start over here, create that public perception around uh, a higher end product, and then that will fund and kind of create a pull through demand for the industry. So that's the theory. <laughs> 
So here is, I'm standing with Jack, and he's a third generation cricket farmer in the United States. And he's one of the reasons I started with crickets as an insect. We, we've been farming insects in this country for about 80 years. And it started with kind of fish bait and then led to reptile feed. And, and a lot of uh, people in the industry are now viewing kind of human consumption as the next major phase in, in the growth of their industry. And, and I don't know if you can see it in this photo, but, uh, oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> well, you can't see in that photo because it's no longer on screen. But that was the first bag of organic, non-GMO fed crickets to ever enter the, the US market that we were holding together for that photo. Um, but anyway, we started with crickets in part because there was a supply infrastructure, kind of skeleton infrastructure of a supply chain already in place. And so we worked with Jack to tweak his practices, raise them for human consumption, and then bring them to our kitchen. And so this, is our this was our kitchen in Salt Lake City where we received the crickets frozen. We rinse them just like you would a, a bag of shrimp. And then we slow roast them in convection ovens and then put them through a, a stone mill and grind them into a flour. And so uh, when we started this, it was, we, we started with literally like $4,000 in a, a Kickstarter campaign. So I only had enough money for like hourly rentals of kitchen. And I would rent this kitchen for uh, 12 hours, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And then I, I found out nobody used it at night. So I convinced the kitchen over to let me use it for 7 a.m. to 7 a.m. And so I would just, for 24 hours, make this cricket flour. Just stay up all night long with a big old vat of coffee and a big thing of trail mix and just run around in a circle so that I could maximize my like, cleanup and breakdown costs. <laughs> Uh, so there we have it. We, we, the reason we make the flour is, is we're trying to make that California roll and eliminate that visual component. So that's why we make the flour. And there's our California roll. So we add it to an all-natural gourmet energy bar and very much intended to be that very gentle introduction for consumers, but at the same time just a, a wrecking ball to that, that consumer perception to pave way for a, a more efficient agricultural component. So Still all in theory. <laughs> this is when the rubber met the road, is when we took it out to, to consumers to see what they actually thought of it. And uh, we started very grassroots, kind of at local farmers markets. We'd cut them up and sample them, and in the beginning it was rough. Oh, this was kind of pre-2013 when the United Nations FAO report came out with this report that was insects to feed the growing global populations. And that did tremendous things for kind of the concept of it. But this was all before that. And, and we'd get these reactions of like, what are you doing? And we were so fired up. It's like, you know, 90% of our global water resources go to agriculture, and this is a much more efficient form of food. And, you know, if you eat this, you can pave the way for this agricultural commodity. And, and people look at you kind of like, oh, well, like, you'd think they were following along, and then they would say something like, you mean real crickets? <laughs> we quickly learned our kind of value proposition and what resonated with different, different people. Uh, but I, I, I quickly adopted, I, I think if I had, had let a lot of that you know, negativity affect me, I would not be doing this still today. And I adopted a lesson that I learned while I was in grad school. And I had a National Science Foundation to implement um, water education in the public schools, and so we got to listen to these phenomenal speakers. And one was a, a teacher of the year, public school teacher in, in the Bronx, and he said that, and he did phenomenal things with his classroom. He had like Shakespeare productions with the fourth graders and really kind of underserved populations. And he said, on any given day, he walks into a classroom and there's a few students who just aren't going to receive the message. They're not going to be receptive to it for whatever reason. Maybe they didn't eat breakfast, something's going on in their home life. And then there's going to be a few students who just are fired up and they're there to learn. And, and it can change who is who on any given day, but the, most of the students are somewhere in the middle. And he found if he, he really tried to kind of pick these, these problem students up, um, he would create this kind of gravitational pull towards acting out and whatnot. But if he just threw his energy into these students that were excited to learn, kind of created a momentum in the other direction, oftentimes even these problem students would come along. Cause, you know, that was the fun thing to do. 
So at these events, that's what I would do is, you know, people would say something, I just would totally ignore it, totally ignore it. I would just be looking for the one person that was excited, and finally someone would be like, wow, that's a cool idea. I'd be like, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Come, learn more. And, but it was effective. You'd get people, all these people on the fence kind of looking around, and, and it, was, it was an effective strategy. We called it uh, blind and sheer optimism. And then, of course, 2014, we went on Shark Tank. And I think that was really the, the pivotal moment for not only our company, but kind of the, the, the industry, the growth of the industry. Um, it, it, interesting enough that there's, there's five sharks on the panel, and it was very similar to kind of general reactions at any farmer's market. There was, there was Mark Cuban, who was kind of intrigued and, and interested. And then there was like Robert Herjavec was like, oh, gross, not for me, no way. And then the other three were like, hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure what I think about this, but uh, they end up all, all trying it and whatnot. Um, but one of the things that was really exciting to me is that this show is watched by uh, six million people this episode, but more importantly, it's the number one show watched by families together. And so I, I saw this as a way to kind of get into the homes when potentially people are eating dinner and have those conversations about, you know, what are we choosing to eat and what are the kind of future implications of, of those decisions of, of what we consciously decided to put on our plate. And, and maybe that was too romantic for you know, ABC prime time, but that's what I was really excited about was you know, these longer, kind of higher view conversations that I was potentially having. Um, we also received a, a big award uh, later that year. We went to um, Natural Products Expo in, in Anaheim, California. There's 80,000 people at, at this event, all industry, um, industry related professionals. And we ended up winning the, the product of the show, the most innovative product in the US. And we were, at that time, we were, there was two of us still hand making all of our bars and we were competing with Cliff Bar and Nature's Valley and all these big brands and, and we ended up winning it. And so it was, it was a sign that we had tremendous support from the food industry because of our mission and <clears throat> trying to connect those dots, you know, not only to the consumer, but everyone along the way in that supply chain. And we re it was really inspiring to have that support from, from the industry, from the natural foods industry, really validate our product. And, and those two were really pivotal, as I said, in the, in the industry. And, and there were several companies that, that came online after that. And so, you know, naturally you have this element of competition, but um, I have a video here to, to kind of talk about our philosophy on, on competition in our marketplace. Um, has anyone seen David Sievers' uh, leadership from a, a dancing guy? Oh, yes. Whoops. My, my back button isn't working. Bear with us. Should I just talk about it? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Bear with us, this is less than a three minute If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key, you must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. 
Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. I'm not done yet. Uh, I, yeah, I love that video. There's just a, so many lessons you could take out of that from a marketing perspective on influencer marketing and kind of stages of consumer adoption. But uh, this is truly how we kind of view the growth of our industry is, is we're really trying to make our, our dance kind of easy to follow and uh, really supporting and, and kind of viewing the next followers as, as equals and, and really kind of mentoring a lot of the other companies that are that are coming online after us because it, uh, as, as you already got a sneak peek, there's um, a, a great uh, metaphor that Elon Musk uses for his, his open source strategy. He's, he says, kind of puts it as, um, we're all on a boat together and there's holes in this boat. And if you have the technology for a bucket that can bail a lot faster than the person next to you, wouldn't you want to share that with them? And that's absolutely what is happening with our food system. You know, the, the overconsumption of resources is essentially holes in our boat, and, and we need to, to have a collaborative atmosphere to, to really solve a lot of these problems. Um, I, I've been speaking at a lot of big food events, and uh, I, I try and drive that point home, and it, and it really resonates. And I think there is a lot of really good um, kind of collaborative efforts and, and a, a shift in our perspective about you know, in the food system, viewing this as, you know, ha having the honor to, to really represent and be stewards of our food and, and the consumption of our resources that, that produce that food uh, with the future in mind. Um, there's, there's really kind of inspiring progress in that direction. And I'm, I, every talk I give, I always put this slide in. I'm like, I'll figure out the kind of something that it relates to but I'm just gonna tell you right now I really like this photo and I, I'm not gonna talk about it there it is it's cute <laughs> uh, no I will um, I think that uh, one of the things that has worked well for us in uh, for a number of reasons is is just that kind of sheer optimism and kind of celebration and having fun with this as I said it's it's far too easy to kind of view a lot of the the kind of daunting dilemmas that, that your generation faces as far as you know, the, the resource consumption, that, that uh, the trajectory that we're on as far as that goes. And uh, if you really truly want to get people behind you, you, you have to be having fun. Um, and having a positive message and a solution-oriented message is really the only way to, to kind of get people behind you and create momentum. And then on the other side of that, it's the only way to kind of sustain your own personal energy, especially when people are kind of making those faces at you all the time. So it, it's critical, no matter what you're doing, 
no matter how serious of issues you're addressing, to, to make sure that you'll always take time to, to have fun with what you're doing. And like I said, there's, there's, I think there's really inspiring progress um, in the food industry where I work. In the last five years, there was an unprecedented 4% loss in market share from the top 10 branded CPG companies, and it went to small and medium-sized companies in the food world. And one reason why that is is food trends are happening faster, and, and the more nimble, smaller organizations can react to those trends and, and be innovative. But another key component of that is that the consumer is losing faith and trust in large companies to act for the health of them, their families, and the planet. And who's taking that trust on are local companies who are, are advertising and marketing increase in transparency, whether it's in their food chain, whether it's the end use of their product, really innovative products. And, and those, are, those are gaining market share. And so there's, there's traction in, in the right direction as far as connecting that end consumer because like I said in the beginning, those are the most important decisions that are going to be made in the future as far as our, our resources go, is the individual level at the consumer level. And so I, I've chosen a path of entrepreneurship and um, the, the free market as a tool to kind of create change at that level, at the consumer level, because that's really kind of the brain behind where we're steering this ship where I learned from a, a planning level at my days at, at trying to manage water from kind of a, a high level and, and frustrated at, at the fact that there was um, so much influence at, at, this, at the consumer level. But that frustration is just in vain, and, and you can really pour yourself into that. And I think that there's just so much room for creativity to really just get in the brain of, of the individual and their needs as they relate to the masses and the direction that, that they are taking us with regards to you know, the resources that we're, we're using. And you know, if you choose to, to take on the path of entrepreneurship or, or you know, use capitalism as an as a impact-based tool, then there's, there's just so much opportunity out there now to, because the consumer does want to be connected with those end uses. They do want to know what's happening with the packaging after the fact. They do want to know that it was sourced from a reliable, um, you know, uh, whether it's a, a free trade or whether it's an organic source. And so there's just plenty of opportunity that's really exciting and, um, and it's necessary because, you know, as I said in the beginning, we, we are in this 11th hour. And I, I recently, uh, or I, I had my first son a, a year ago, he's gonna turn one year old in, on Wednesday and we named him Atlas and that's, we named him Atlas because that's kind of how I view your generation is that you, know, you have some pretty daunting tasks. You have a pretty big load on your shoulders here, but, uh, but I have faith in you and your strength to be able to carry that. So uh, that's it. I tried to leave enough room for questions because there are often many. <laughs> Okay, we now have time for questions and answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and Sarah or I will come to you. So these bars are kind of like the gateway first step. What do you see as the next step or the final vision of insect consummation? Yeah, the gateway bug is what yeah. we call it. <laughs> um, we're launching it. We're going to do another Kickstarter campaign. Um, fingers crossed, kind of mid-November. Mid and... Uh, we're launching the, the Cricut Flower as a standalone product. It's kind of a little more user-friendly, so a flavored protein line. Um, I, I did not have any food experience, any like packaging, like no CPG, no consumer good experience. It was all planning, and so I learned a lot on the fly. And I think one of the biggest things I've learned is just whittling your value proposition down to the individual and like the health properties are what really resonate at the individual level. Like, well, how am I personally gonna benefit from this? And, and the health of the insect protein is just stands alone, and, and we, we're trying to isolate that, basically. Um, the, the bars are great, they taste delicious, uh, but our, our real value is in that excellent protein, and so we're, we're launching that to really um, focus on that marketing message. 
But I, I'm also excited, you know, we, we started at this consumer level when there really wasn't the supply chain. And so as we're doing this, we're, we're taking kind of a couple steps back in the supply chain. So I'm really excited about um, a couple of other insects that we're raising, you know, on the kind of agricultural byproduct. Uh, really excited. We just have to make sure we brand them right. We can't, can't leave that part behind. Hi, Pat. Um, so my question, uh, ha you mentioned GMOs a couple times without really going into it during your speech. And I'm just wondering, uh, what role do you think GMOs will or will not play in the future in creating more sustainable food sources? Oh, man. I restart the clock. I need another 45 minutes here. Um, I... Yeah, so as a scientist, there's relatively few absolutes, but I think one absolute is that diversity equals health. And so anything that infringes upon the diversity deteriorates the health. And so I think that's my biggest issue with them, is that if we're looking at it from a risk management perspective, we absolutely need a wider variety, and it will be harder to control from a single organization but I don't think that's a bad thing, it, especially when it comes to our food supply. There's absolutely no such thing as too big to fail. So that's one of my biggest issues. And I, I don't think that all the science is completely um, uh, is de undebatable whether it does maximize productivity or not. I, I think the argument is still on the table as far as increasing our productivity from a GMO perspective. One reason why I feed my crickets non-GMO organic feed is market driven. That the people that want our product are natural product focused. They're the organic food shopper and that's what they wanted. So that's what we're gonna make because th that was our early adopter. And you know, that's the difference between kind of the European debate and the, the US debate, you know, it's very, regulated in, in Europe, but here it's very market driven. Whole Foods has decided they're not gonna have any GMO products in their stores and that, that wasn't regulated, that was pure consumer driven. And so I you know I, I, I get excited about the momentum that that can create, but um, it's a complicated argument that I yeah. As far as kind of health concerns, and there's there's no, I don't think there's anything substantiated. There's no evidence that there should be a individual health concern. Um, you know, whether you want to be the guinea pig for that or not is, is up to you, I think. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, something, I understand the problem with the lack of efficiency in a lot of the food sources now, but something that I personally have a problem with is the industrial agricultural complex, and I understand that your product is made, you know, by you in small quantities. But looking, and I've, I've read a lot into the insects uh, food source, you know, you can raise them at home and then you can eat them. But looking at it logically, it seems like that food source would be the most easy to industrialize in terms of having massive, um, you know, farms with all of these insects. and. My family are actually cowboys out in Nebraska, and they have a ranch with like a thousand cattle, and they slaughter, they breed the cattle, they slaughter them. We have a restaurant, we sell it there, and it's like, I really like the idea that American farmers and American ranchers can bring something from the farm to the table, and I just struggle to see that happening on a large scale with the insect protein product. I'm just curious what you think about that and like the future and how you can kind of maintain that style of agriculture with this new food source. Yeah, it's, uh, that's a very insightful um, vision of it. Um, yeah, there's a difference in kind of mammal husbandry and, and avian husbandry in that the, the real impacts from a waste perspective are, it's a pretty easy equation as far as just population density. When you, you know, if you have range-fed cattle, it's, it's completely different than a, than a CAFU and a confined agricultural uh, you know, feedlot. It, and 
it's, there's, a, there's a tipping point where you just have too many bodies per unit of area. Uh, insects is a little different because they naturally have these dense populations and you can raise them kind of vertically. And that's one of the efficiencies of them from that land perspective. But I, that is a very valid concern that you could potentially industrialize them. Um, I think that um, I, I don't need to have complete ownership of the, in, of the industry from start to finish. I, I just need to get it started and, and kind of have faith that it will continue to go in, a, in good directions. Um, one of the benefits of them is that they can be grown in an urban environment and that by nature limits the, the expansion of them. There, there's a couple really cool projects. Um, they're looking into abandoned warehouses in Detroit right now and converting those into insect farms. So I, I think that the efficiency will really be driven by kind of the, looking at it from a macro view of, of the efficiency of, of the food transportation and, and getting it from farm to fork, as you say, uh, where you just can't do that when it's industrialized off-site. Um, so I, I don't have a clear answer for you as far as what will be done to prevent you know, mass industrialization of insect farming. Um, but I, I think it, it sort of reminds me of a, a Wendell Berry quote of like, uh, we, don't, we don't have the right to um, speculate whether this is gonna work or not. We just have the right to know what is good today and take actionable steps towards doing that in our own lives. So uh, I don't know if that was much of an answer for you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. We're far from that right now, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> we have a long way to go with consumer perception. <laughs> I remember kind of diving into water, you know, I had this big view of, you know, the species and whatnot. And really, you have to understand your own personal limitations of time and energy and, and really dive into what you think is, is going to help. And, and it, there's no single solution to a lot of these issues we're facing. And it, you just kind of have to have faith that your colleagues around you are also addressing these, these issues at, for the good as well. Can you hear me on this? Okay, that's weird. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I have the wonderful experience of being able to work with butterflies and moths all the time. But one of my real concerns, one of the reasons why I wanted to come with to this talk is this general abhorrence of insects in our culture and trying to overcome that. And so I was wondering if um, you thought it was possible that in expanding insects into our, our Western food culture would also be a way for us to expand awareness of the insects ar around us and how that might relate to conservation efforts. Uh, that's fascinating. Um, uh, good question. So the question, if you didn't hear, how can kind of our crusade about public perception around eating insects potentially raise awareness for conservation of kind of insect populations in general? Is that a good summary? Uh, yeah, there's huge issues, whether it's, you know, our, our honeybees or, uh, I, I don't know, that one's yours. <laughs> How can they raise where? I'm trying to think offhand of other examples where consuming a product has also kind of increased the awareness of them. I, it's actually something that I, I, we kind of struggle with. I, sh I should have thrown up some pictures of our original packaging. Our original packaging had, uh, background was all kind of natural, uh, like encyclopedic drawings of insects, because I re was really adamant about, like, we're going to educate people about their food and what's in it and what. <laughs> we did some focus groups and consumer feedback, and people did not like to look at the insect. And so <laughs> I, I'm struggling with an answer because in some regards, people just do not want to know what they're eating. And, I mean, we make a flower out of it for a reason. Uh, and so people don't want to be connected, and that's the landscape that I'm operating a, a packaged food product in. 
So uh, I, I put that challenge onto you, but I welcome your ideas. <laughs> Hi, I really liked your talk. Uh, so my question is that um, you talked about how there are barriers in different parts of the world, like Europe, in terms of you know um, regulation, manufacturing, etc. So do you actually see the cricket farms or insect farms um, or the industry moving over to other parts of the world in the future, or is this just localized to the U.S.? No, um, it's already kind of spreading. There's uh, so we were the first product in the U.S., but also one of the first products kind of in the Western world, kind of branding it as this introduction to, to our culture. And there's now a cricket bar. There's a couple in the U.S. There's one in the U.K. There's one in Finland. There's one in France. There's one in Germany. There's one in Australia. And there might be a couple. Oh, there's two in Canada. Uh, so it's already spreading. Uh, at a pretty large degree, and uh, the industry can can rapidly the, the biggest room for improvement and innovation at this point is in the, the agricultural side and rearing the insects, which kind of can be done anywhere um, and there 's really innovative projects happening kind of all over the world south africa is is leading the way right now it, or i don 't know about leading, but South Africa is doing some really innovative projects right now, and so it 's absolute i mean the, the supply and demand graph I showed over the Colorado River is kind of a, a later term issue when you look at like India's water and you know the, the Middle East. Like these are issues that happened long ago as far as the overconsumption. The, the groundwater reserves in, in India specifically are dire right now. They're very shallow and it's the fastest melting glacier in the world, the Himalayan glacier, and so their base flow for the majority of their surface water is diminishing. Like, these are big issues around the world, and so everyone is looking at where are we going to get our water, where are we going to get our food, and so insects, I think in part that United Nations report really put it on the map, and so there's, there's some pretty cool projects happening um, kind of all over the world, and you know, whether you know, we're just kind of playing our role in it, especially kind of from the marketing side, but um, you know, being that the, the innovation will happen at that agricultural level, that's it, kind of an exciting thing is that it, it can happen quickly and it can be remote. You know, you can transport these things. They're not tied to a specific field and they, they have really short lifespans. So you can see an evolution within their own species too. So um, yeah, all, yeah there, it is by no means limited to the U.S. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'd like to ask about, at the beginning you were talking about the water inefficiency of um, the cattle and a lot of other types of meat. And one solution to that is crickets. Um, but another potential solution is vegetarianism. Um, and that faces its own sort of branding PR type problems. Um, it's viewed as like the domain of hippies in a lot of uh, the media portrayals. Um, and the, like the tofu industry doesn't have the same advertising cloud is McDonald's. Um, but yeah, that I was wondering if you, you could talk a bit about whether you see vegetarianism as another potential avenue um, for conserving water. Um, I know you had some harsh words for lentils earlier, but yeah, if you could just talk more about that. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Lentils. <laughs> uh, I, I'm mostly a vegetarian. Um, no, it is, like I said earlier, there's, we need a variety of solutions and absolutely more plant-based diet. Um, no, wholeheartedly, like, but increase the diversity within the plant spectrum as well. Um, I, I, that the main argument of like, why not just plants? Why do we need to bring insects? I think really that's where the, the void the insects fill that plants don't is it their adaptability to changes in the environment. Um, and so I, I have to lead with that. I'm not critical of plants necessarily, but by absolutely we need a more kind of plant-focused protein diet, um, especially in, in Western worlds. Um, so what was the second part of that? I just need to be clear that I don't, I love lentils. 
<laughs> love lentils. Uh, yeah, I think you answered most yeah. of it. I was just wondering about whether yeah. you see vegetarianism as a potential avenue. So. Yeah, yeah. So I, um, there's some really cool projects right now. There's a, a really fascinating article in, um, uh, in Pacific Standard of how uh, Beyond Meat has gotten meat to bleed. I don't know if anyone's seen that. Yeah, so it's something with kind of extracting, I think it's some bean isolate, and then they put it into yeast, and they've been able to create hemoglobin. And, and so they actually make this plant-based meat bleed. And uh, I don't know if that's the solution. I'm really suspicious of mimicking meat uh, because there are so many just phenomenal plant-based meals that don't have to pretend to be something else. I, I think that's my biggest issue is that if you're, if you're pretending to be something else, you'll never achieve that status. And so I, I don't like plant-based imitations of meat. I don't eat them in my personal diet, but I eat a ton of vegetables. So I, I, as far as a marketing perspective, like celebrate plants like for who they are as individuals <laughs> and, and don't mimic meat. I want to thank you for um, the, just the creativity that you had when approaching this problem, um, just from the very root of trying to solve our, um, solve our issue with water supplies and everything. And I wanted to ask also, from an ecological standpoint, um, just about how you'd go about raising crickets in different environments and the possible issue with the invasiveness of certain crickets or certain insect uh, populations in other areas and regions of the world, and how you guys would sort of work around issues of invasiveness and um, speciation in certain uh, areas. Would you guys have different um, availabilities of different species in different areas just to make sure that you guys didn't harm different uh, environments too much? That's pretty much my question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Again, not a simple solution to that one. Uh, my grand view of what I would like to do for a food company is have an insect-based product that's specific to a region, made in that region, only touch solar-powered facilities, delivered by bicycle, but I'm <laughs> not confident in my ability to sell a $27 energy bar. And so what I've done is kind of create priorities and kind of tick them off along the way. And so the more momentum you have, the, more, the easier it is to kind of roll out of it. Our first, our first product was not organic. It, in small batches, it's extremely expensive. And so once we were able to sell a little bit, we had it in our price model where our price was gonna stay the same, but as we increased our volumes, we checked that box off and started putting organic ingredients in. So uh, that's kind of a long-winded way of, of saying we're only using one species right now. It is native to the US, but it is not native everywhere where potentially farms could go. Um, I, I, I celebrate other companies coming on board in part to like, increase the diversity of not only, not only build our industry, but increase the diversity within the industry. You know, other insects, other species, absolutely there's room for that. As far as I think what I've been able to um, justify as far as introducing a, a species in a certain area is that they do have a fairly limited lifespan. And so if there ever is kind of an outbreak, if you will, if they get out, they die pretty quickly. And they're not, they're not evolved with that habitat necessarily. And so there, to date, there have been no there's been no evidence of species getting out into the farm and then being an invasive species, um, I think that there's cer that's certainly a talk that's that's on the priority list as we grow. I don't th we have not our demand. We are still a very small company. Our demand has not warranted you know a mega facility of insect production. We're still working within the framework of what already exists. If we were to design one, absolutely that would be a part of, of the design to kind of have increased. Um, adherence to making sure that that was a risk that we didn't, that we w had thought about and, and planned for at least. Hi, 
um, I really enjoyed your talk today. Thank I had you. a question about your audience and your target audience. So I know you spoke a little bit about um, you adding organic and making it non-GMO for a certain na people who like organic food and nature food. But I was wondering, have you ever thought about targeting sports people, people who really care about protein and really need that to replenish themselves you know, after games and such? Yeah, I mean, that, that's one reason why we started with an energy bar. We, we, so let me take a couple steps back. So when you start a business, you need to do market research on who's going to consume your product. There was no market for us to research when we started, so it was all just a guess. It's very contrary to kind of business 101. Uh, so we thought that the most receptive audience would be people that are active in the outdoors, that would like to protect the environment with which they recreate in. And so that's why we created an energy bar on the go for outdoor enthusiasts. And we created the nutritional profile for kind of on the go consumption. That was our assumption that we made. I think we are finding now through, and then we just like splattered it all around. So like bike shops, like natural food store, museum, everywhere that we could, we just sold it so that we could get feedback on where it was doing well, what demographics was it selling well in. Um, our, our, what we're learning is that, yeah, the very protein focused kind of athlete is adopting it faster than our kind of outdoor recreationalists that we assumed. Turns out people that live in the van and rock climb don't want to pay $3 for an energy bar. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the, fo the, the quality of the protein is really what makes it stand out on the shelf. It's a complete protein, very digestible, contains all the essential amino acids. And so um, that's why we're, we're kind of tailoring new products. And so we're, our business model was to be adaptable to, to feedback that we, that we received as we kind of go along. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, just sort of a practical, I think this will be an easy question. Oh, Do, <laughs> I've gotten some difficult ones. Do, does the flour, the cricket flour, function in the same way that rice or wheat flour functions? So can you make cookies and bread? And if so, how does it affect the taste of the cookie? Or the bread. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a protein powder. I called it cricket flour, and that's kind of the industry term because I, I was yeah, I was so focused on language and perception, and I thought flour was you know, more associated with food than powder or meal. Like, which a more accurate definition would be like cricket meal or cricket powder. Uh, so we sell that as a standalone product on our on our website, but we. It's like 65 to 70 percent protein. Uh, we also sell a, a baking flour that what you're asking about, and so we added starches to it. So we added rice starch and we added tapioca starch to have the binding properties of a, of a typical baking flour. So um, that you have to add starch to make it have those properties. The taste is kind of nutty, like it's kind of pretty mild, kind of earthy. Like if you've ever had hemp, <laughs> these are very, <laughs> who's, who's in marketing here that knows what I'm trying to say? Uh, no, it's kind of like hemp protein. That's the similar, like a mix between hemp and sunflower seeds. That's the closest thing, yeah. So I actually have two questions. One is more for levity and a follow-up to this. Um, have you had whole crickets? Probably you have, and do you enjoy that? And then a more serious question, uh, I'm an environmental economist, and so my thought is that the foundation here is that water is just not priced right. And one bullet point you didn't come up with was, why not just charge more for water and therefore your competition like beef and chicken would raise and be not as profitable and alternatives might be more successful. Uh, yes, I have eaten a whole cricket. Uh, how much time do we have? A whole long story behind that. But uh, I, do I enjoy it? Um, yeah, it, kind of a side note, but um, we were talking about at the table here, I, I wanted this, I, I take this very seriously. You know, I have this high level view of our food supply and I, I want this to be a serious commodity. And so I was very averse to any sort of kind of gimmicky, like uh, novelty element associated with it. 
but I'm kind of coming around on that in that I appreciate the fact that uh, every time you consume an insect, it's just that much easier. For whatever reason you tried it the first time, if it was for shock value, the next time you, you're presented with it, that shock is not as strong. You're, willing, you're able to look at it a little more logically. So I, I now see the merit and the novelty element of it to some degree, and we may play with that. Just, I'm not sure, not 100% convinced, because I was so opposed to it. Uh, your second question, uh, because I wasn't in charge of the water pricing, that's why. Um, I remember specifically sitting at a, a conference and we were talking about, actually we were talking about dilapidating water infrastructure and uh, we were, essentially we were talking about how we we're gonna fund this and it was something like a $5 rate increase to, to fund these, this mega project to, to renovate our, our water treatment facility. And it was, it's just assumed that that's political suicide to propose a, a $5 increase in rate hike. And so what that means to me is that it needs a much better marketing campaign. That, that was kind of this epiphany I had. Absolutely, we need to charge more water for it. But if it's political suicide to propose that, it means it's not being branded correctly. We don't even blink. If my cell phone bill goes up five, ten dollars $10, I might not even notice it. But to be outraged over a $5 price of my water, we need to do a better job of marketing conservation and marketing our natural resources. And uh, um, there's like, plenty of creative ways to do that. Uh, but, but again, limitations of time and energy. Uh, but that's where I, I really see the need for it because any, anyone that is in the position to propose that, at least where I, in the districts I worked in, nobody was willing to risk their political career on proposing increase in water. It was political suicide, as they called it. So let's rebrand it. Hi, this is just out of sheer curiosity. Okay. I know you make the crickets into flour before putting them into the bars, but would you happen to know how many crickets are in each bar approximately? I do. <laughs> uh, it's about, uh, it depends on what flavor. So we have uh, four flavors, and I model them after a region of the world that eats insects, so I try to make that kind of cultural connection. So we have uh, a central Mexico dark chocolate coffee cayenne, and that one has about 20 crickets in it. And we have a Thailand coconut ginger lime. That one has about 30. And then the highest is a, a Japanese style. It's matcha green tea, goji, nori flakes. And that one has almost 40 crickets in it. You know, it's our highest protein bar. And I actually have a couple back there. I don't know if I have one for everyone. Ugh, so I, does anyone have an idea how to do this? OK. Meet me over there if you really want one. Yeah, you want, Brian, want to pass them out? Yeah. Yeah, you could maybe just open them up on that table there. And uh, if you're dying for one and you find a partner, maybe you can share one. I, I think I have uh, probably about, probably have about 60 or so bars back there. So. Sorry I didn't. We have oh, time yeah. for Web two more questions. Yeah, website is chapul.com, C-H-A-P-U-L. Yeah. Hi, uh, so I want to go back to plant-based meat products, which we were talking about earlier. Um, to me, I think meat is such a big part of our cultures that we need something that is very much like a substitute for um, the food system to become more sustainable. Um, could you talk more about why you're wary of something that pretending to be meat. Yeah, and this is, I mean, this is speculation. It, like, there's probably plenty of focus groups that it's not where my focus is, and there's probably data out there to support consumer perceptions around, especially what vegetarians think of it, and that's really what matters a lot more than my kind of speculative opinion. But I, it's just a simple, if you're trying to imitate something, you'll never achieve it. You'll never be as good as the real thing and it's just entirely based on that. Um, and maybe that was because I grew up with like Morning Star veggie burgers that were just awful. And now there's phenomenal bean veggie burgers out there and whatnot. So um, yeah, it, it, that's basically it. If you're trying to imitate something, you'll never be it. You'll never achieve the, 
that level of quality. I think there's an opportunity to make dog food or like pig food or fish food out of crickets and just eliminate the, uh, the human part completely and still save water. Do I think there is? Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we're kind of we're involved with a, a project actually kind of along the lines of that the sea bass to uh, make a a meal for for fish specifically to minimize our impact on our our fisheries. Um, yeah, I, I think that if you it's you have to be careful where you start. I think if you start branding it as a food product as a like pet feed, then that's kind of where the consumer perception is going to lie. <laughs> I should. <laughs> uh, so I, I wanted to start hi, like, hi, let's let's make this like a very serious product for people that are really foodies, and I think that's the last question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's just kind of a final statement. Again, I, I really am enthusiastic for, for your future and, and kind of where you guys get to dive in and, and be creative in solving a lot of these problems. And uh, if you do see that kind of shirtless dancer, just follow them along as well. You have many of those amongst yourselves. So thank you very much.